others during abductions. He says, um, you set forth a unique energetic vibration that we receive. We receive that vibration. And because we are primarily what you would call service to self beings, there are two um, different types of beings and sentient beings are both service to self and service to others. Sentient beings were created to be in service to others, but then they were attacked, abused, harmed. They become, they became an unethical display that greatly disrupted your planet. And then intervention had to be, um, we had to request permissions for intervention for your planet. So it's not so wonderful that you're always sentient and you have associated sentient with something that is only good. Sentience can destroy a planet. I think I have lost track of your original question in the midst of all that. I was just asking why do they pick certain people over, oh. them, over others? He said, so in that sense, we pick certain people for various reasons, but we hear a call, a longing, a desire, if you will, a vibration for that longing, for that desire. If you have a deep curiosity and you keep thinking about it and thinking about it, your vibrational point of focus is singular. And much like if you were to point a laser into the sky and then add another laser and another laser and another laser and another laser, you would form a very large laser show. And then maybe some beings in the sky would say, right there. We know that in our experiments, we're going to get a lot of information from someone who can project that strongly. So are you projecting something that would be of service to self? That would be of non-sentience and we'd be curious how that's working. If you are projecting victimhood, we'd be curious how that's working. Perhaps your sentience isn't working if you are falling into victimhood patterns and fears. We study both the benefits and the detriments of sentience and non-sentient display in the genetics of humans. And that is because of your painful history. Your DNA has been dramatically mutilated. It's been shifted, it's been changed. You are not the same genetically speaking. And there are many beings who have come to your planet and there's so much alteration. There is alteration from beings who abduct you and in place implants to alter your DNA. There is alteration in your DNA and RNA from certain medicines. There is alteration in your DNA and RNA from certain vibrational force fields. You have been experimented in weather. You've been experimented on and experimented on and experimented on since you have come here. So if you do not have in your unique vibration and alignment the belief that you could be a victim of that. We don't hold interest in you. So in that case, for instance, giving an example, he says, one who would consider themselves an enlightened being, who is primarily putting their single focus on happiness, joy, freedom. They are focused on their health. They are focused on everything that they can find that's positive and empowering for them. They don't tend to gravitate towards, nor do they attract anything that I just described to you. They will not become a victim of such. Okay. So we are not interested in them because they do not require our assistance. We do not come to you for abductee experiences simply out of curiosity or to harm you and then send you back with that pain. We are ethical beings. We choose you based upon not just your conscious desire and energy field, but what is subconscious as well. And if you are not aware of your subconscious calling and energy field, you could be in the throes of an abductee contactee experience and you will need to remember. It'll be important to begin to remember the experience without fear, without victimhood. 
because the majority of the gray species for what you call us, the zeta reticulin species, do not wish to do you harm. Are there some subsets who are working for other beings? And they have left our species and they've become drones. They're similar to worker bees for other colonies, such as the Alpha Draconi, absolutely. But there are, those are few and far between. And if your calling is one of absolute desperation and fear, you could attract them for sure, but they have nothing to do with the majority of the Zeta Reticulin species. They have nothing to do with us. That's a break off. That's a rebel. And we have been judged unfairly, unequitably, because of their actions. We are here to protect you from them. Oh, that's very interesting. Because they work for primarily Alpha Draconi beings and other types of beings, Maldekian beings, many, many forms of beings who do wish for harm, who do wish for control over your planet. And those types of abductee experiences are painful beyond measure. And they do not hold any care for how they abduct you or how they treat you. They don't care to wipe your memory if a painful event occurred because they don't hold care for you. We don't hold emotions, but we do hold care. Do you see the difference? Yeah. So <clears throat> you guys take care when you when people are abducted and you look after the humans. And do you say that you wipe their memories or anything like that? Or absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Most humans are not of the psychological capacity to even manage what would happen in an experience outside of time. If you consider the emotional trauma okay. for a very dense belief system. Even for a very curious being, it's still a lot to manage. It's still a lot to, 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 to try to believe, to try to understand. And do humans work collaboratively with you or are there, is it just all new and they're wondering where the hell am I? <laughs> <laughs> we do not abduct humans that are working collaboratively with us. That okay. would not be of any use to us, save this exceptional example. Um, and I say exceptional not to mean that she's better than, but just unusual example. This is an unusual example of, example of a collaboration. How did you meet Pamela originally? Where'd you find her? <laughs> that is between she and I. <laughs> <laughs> she wishes not to display the information. No worries at all. Um, Perhaps she is overly curious. <laughs> yes, probably. Um, um, he says that they don't form collaborations with general people who um, want the abduction for the sake of having the abduction or want to talk to ETs for the sake and curiosity of talking to ETs. Okay, because that's he, the question we have here. He says that um, he, he, he wants, this is supposed to be, that primarily on your planet, there was um, a clause for non-intervention for millions of years based upon the damage that was done. Um, you've had so much damage done, so many different beings wanting to mine your planet for different degrees of energy. They would mine your animals and they still do. They still do um, that sort of thing. Um, and now we have to have intervention to protect your animals, to protect your land, to protect you. Um, and we need you just to feel that protection and to understand that being human is about being human, enjoying earth, enjoying being in your body, um, enjoying that feeling of understanding this thing you call emotion and, and the beauty of it. You simply don't understand that there aren't many beings like you okay and when do you guys ever come to earth when you come to earth do you do you like to see sunsets and sunrises is, are they the kind of things you have in and in, in your normal day to day or is there something different when you come here and you see these things um they are on a what's called a dwarf star it's dying so, so they've had to live like uh, Ty lives on a craft primarily because a lot of the planet is just almost dead. 
And they are very misunderstood beings. And a lot of beings have stories out there saying that they're trying just to mess with humans and get their DNA because they don't have gender or reproductive organs. Um, but that's not the case. It's just they don't have that type of gender experience and they don't have reproductive organs because that's not their experience. They don't need them. So they don't need our DNA to actually reproduce. They can do so at will whenever they want, but they do need a planet to do it upon and they don't want it to be ours. He says um, the idea that many beings are coming here because they want to take over and live on our planet is absolutely ludicrous with the exception of the Alpha Draconi, which are already here and doing so. Um, and, and he said he can talk about that if you wish. However, the, the idea of other beings wanting to take over our planet and to be on it is just ludicrous because their experience is so much different. Not that it's better than, it's just so different that they wouldn't even understand. They'd, they'd have to be a part of time. They'd have to be a part of duality. They'd have to agree to be sentient. They'd have to agree to do something dramatically different because even the universal laws are different. You, they can't just come take over. They don't even breathe oxygen. You see? Okay. They can't. When Roswell landed, yes, the beings okay. couldn't breathe. On, that's why most of them died. It wasn't because the crash itself and the impact killed them. There were That was the case for two of them. But um, there were two more. There was four on the craft. Today. There were four. Were they um, small greys? or were They were they... small greys. Okay. Yeah. Why, why were they coming here? Or did they just happen to crash and it was just unfortunate? Oh, no, you don't happen to crash. He said, Earth is way out of the way. You don't... <laughs> <laughs> he said, that never happens. People don't just like, it's so far out of the way. It's, it takes great effort for most beings to want to come here. Yeah. Um, and, and they don't come, they don't really have reason to come here except to protect or to study. And greys don't protect. They don't have the capacity. They're not like Alpha Centauri. They're not strong physically. They don't have the type of craft that could, you know, shoot weapons that could harm anyone in the 3D. They don't have, their craft isn't like that. Okay. Um, so they don't, they're not protector beings. They are researcher beings. So they came for that and they knew what they were doing and they were attempting to land, but it just wasn't going well. Okay. <laughs> Um, it just wasn't going well. And they did have some faulty craft for sure. And a lot of um, the human scientists that studied the craft could definitely figure that out. And they did, you know, they were able to surmise that from studying the craft. However, four of those beings were, two of those beings were dead on the spot and two of one, and then one of them um, was struggling. And another one had like some reserve oxygen. Like they know how to, to they know these things. They know that when they land, they have to, have a device to try to secure oxygen if they land for very long, right? But see, they have shields inside of their craft that keep their particular air environment for how they breathe. Okay. So they don't, and it goes with them. So when they leave the craft, it's a bubble of their particular environmental quality of whatever they breathe, um, which is primarily a nitrogen environment. So they don't breathe oxygen. They don't thrive off of it. So they're a nitrogen environment. Okay. It's very, very, very different. So they have that type of environment. Oxygen for them would be poison. Okay. So the other one um, was a baby. It was very young. It didn't know it stepped out of the craft. It breathed oxygen and immediately started getting very sick. Okay. And before, you know, the parent being that was with it, they don't call themselves mother or father, he says, okay. but the parent being that was with it, um, stepped forth and said, oh my gosh, don't run outside the craft, you know, and it was trying to, to put the shield on him, but the ship was broken and the ship is a part of the being's consciousness. So the ship creates uh, a command based upon the person's consciousness if the ship is working. Uh -huh. But if the ship is broken, it's not going to work. It's a disconnect. So then you can't have that shield so that you can breathe in your own environment. So he was trying to get the reserve oxygen, but the the child being or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, companion being is what he calls it, okay. um, actually breathed the oxygen, which is absolutely poisonous to grace. Oh. And it began to get very sick and it was swelling in its um, where, where the lungs are and things It was swelling in this area. Um, and when the government came and swept the area, they uh, took all the bodies and they studied the dead ones 
and they and the guys that were alive type did they take those as well our government thought those oh yeah and they kept one of them alive for a very long time and they figured out how to get him to breathe they he immediately told them he doesn't breathe oxygen that it's going to kill him so they got him out of that environment they were able to get him to breathe and they kept him alive um for about 15 years Wow. They kept him alive inside of Area 51. Did they treat him well? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They treat they treat him well. Like he doesn't need to eat or anything like that. So it wasn't like, you know, they had to like figure out a lot about his craft and, you know, what he needed and things like that, what his needs were. And the problem was like they just wanted to keep him and um like he wanted to get back obviously yeah did um, they try reverse engineering his ship or anything it, it was he says it was a darn if they do darn if they don't situation because he could teach them to reverse engineer the craft mm -hmm. but then um they would be they would try to withhold the promise of letting him go back yeah, they're not too trusted, are they? So then they begin to keep him, keep him, and he did end up making friends with them, you know. But wow. he he lasted for about fifteen years. It's a long time. Yeah, to be on a planet with people that aren't your own. He said he hoped that maybe someday someone would come out and share the information for what they knew about it. But most of those people are already gone, and the people that aren't are too old to remember or talk about it much, or, or are scared. Scared. Yeah. <laughs> So why didn't somebody come and collect him? Why didn't one of you guys or some of his friends or whatever come and collect him? Um, there's plenty more. You don't understand. It. We're not, it's not, the family unit is, is not, we're not missed in that capacity. So, so everything that, disposable? Yeah, everything that I can do because of the way that the construct of what you call soul works, we don't call it that. Okay. But our construct for life force actually is um, just completely, I don't know what the word, it, it regenerates and it is recyclable. We, we recycle. Your soul is recyclable. It recycles. Yeah. So then when we pass away, that essence can be extracted from the egg that we were created with. It's still there. But the essence of it is still there and the scientists can take it and create the same thing and put it immediately into another body and within about two days tops that's if they if it goes well the whole growing process takes um roughly 48 hours in your time space distortion then that essence inside of that egg that's placed into new a new form can come back in that way wow so that way that particular form can stay alive and continue its journey. So in this way, we have what you call hive mentality. So beings don't really die, but we have other forms. So say if I were to die, they have a particular, is similar to your cryo technology, except it's not with freezing. We have a technology that uh, is a part of stasis. It holds us in a cellular um, frozen moment. And we're frozen in time. Everything is on hold. And we taught humans a lot about that. I taught humans a lot about that in my um, in my in my time. So, um, so we do that, and we go into a stasis. That body goes into a stasis. Um, the energy is extracted per se. They will reinvigorate the body and put the energy back in. Or if they can't, they will reinvigorate the spark, that, that egg, and put the egg into another body that's been in stasis if they can't reinvigorate the body. Wow. So this will seem like a silly question, but bear with me. <laughs> so is there a fixed number of souls and they're recycled, or can you generate and make a new soul? We have a fixed number of souls, and all the souls are parts of a whole. It's like those souls are parts of the main hive soul. Oh, wow. That's really interesting, Ty. And that is why no one ever dies. Okay. Bodies can be regenerated and souls can be recycled. And when the soul is recycled, does it... Uh, retain the memories of the last body it was in? It absolutely does. Wow. We remember everything that we've ever mastered. Wow, that's that's really incredible. 
Uh, it's very interesting talking to you, Ty. I do agree that you guys have got a bad rep around the place. Mm. Um, this is very interesting. Thank you so much for doing this.